Okay, um, <clears throat> so why is it that we're discussing Keynesianism and the post-war boom? Uh, you know, why is this important to us today? Well, I think it's pr probably fair to say it was the longest generalized boom uh, in the whole history of capitalism. Uh, you had a period of about 28 years or so from 1945 to 1973. And although it wasn't simply just one straight line upwards, it wasn't, there were, you know, there were still uh, minor sort of ups and downs. Uh, it was probably the greatest explosion of investment, production, trade, science uh, and technique in all of human history. I think the only really comparable period would have been from sort of the end of the 1870s to about 1914. But I think even then it didn't uh, match the scale of the post-war boom. And why it's important is it's, it's inevitably shaped the consciousness of a whole generation of people who lived through that. Uh, and also many, many people as well who didn't live through it, but are sort of, you know, told about this for all sorts of ways, you know, whether it's through uh, literature or films or, you know, ideas in the labour movement. You know, you often hear of uh, grandparents talking about, uh, you know, the good old days. And you know, sometimes you can think, oh, uh, you know, grandma, I just got rose-tinted spectacles or, or something. But I think actually, if you look at it, there's an element of uh, truth in that. You know, if you compare it to today, uh, living standards were on increasing and fairly rapidly. There was you know, a strong welfare state, uh, you had full employment, you had uh, nationalised industries, you had you know, free education, you had you know, affordable and secure council tenancies. Uh, you know, all these kind of things uh, that were, you know, were going forward, that uh, actually compared to today, people actually had, um, you know, had it pretty uh, good. But, and this also gave the illusion that capitalism was actually uh, able to produce the goods. You know, it was a system that could actually provide a decent standard of living to the working class. And for many, this actually represents like, the normality of capitalism. They think that like, that is what the capitalist system is. And that actually what came afterwards with the crisis and, and, and everything since then is really some sort of deviation. And that if we just had the correct sort of policies, we could return to these conditions and everything would be fine. But actually what I want to argue is this really was like a kind of unique period in history and uh, <clears throat> well, particularly in the, the, the history of capitalism and that it was made possible by the coming together of uh, various uh, kind of unique factors uh, primarily the impacts of the Second World War but also uh, you know, political factors as well such as the betrayal of uh, social democracy and the Stalinists after the war uh, you also see on the left today you hear these kind of arguments well you know, if uh, in Britain we could run uh, you know, a huge deficit after the war and create the NHS and the welfare state and all these other things, couldn't we do the same now? And I think, you know, as Marxists, we have to understand, well, okay, if this is the case, then we have to explain why isn't it being done now? Or, alternatively, if this isn't true, if it's not possible to do that, we need to be able to understand why that's the case and actually be able to offer the counter-arguments when we hear these things being raised, you know, whether it's in uh, you know, the student movement, labour movement, or whatever. And there's also this idea that kind of flows from that, which is that you know the austerity and also what's referred to as neoliberalism is just simply some kind of uh, like nasty or kind of evil ideology. Uh, and uh, what we just need is uh, policies for growth. Uh, what they're really saying, what we need is policy, like Keynesian policies. And that I would argue is the real essence, uh, the real meaning of uh, Corbynomics. And therefore, that's what I'm saying. Why, although a lot of what I'm going to cover is historical. It's very relevant to actually the period that we're going through today and, and particularly with countering a lot of the arguments that we come across. Now just to put it in its historical context, obviously as Marxists we, we seek a dialectical view of the world. You know, we want to see things in their wider context, not as isolated fragments, but actually in their with their interconnection with the whole. And I think in understanding Keynesianism and the post-war boom, it's also necessary to place it in its context. We don't just look at that post-war period, but you have to understand the development of capitalism both for and also to a certain extent after as well. And I think you can go all the way back to the period of uh, Marx and Engels. You know, even in the Communist Manifesto, they point out the enormous advances that capitalism had made and was making due to the, uh, to the factors of private ownership of the means of production. Uh, you had production for profit, uh, but also to the fact of competition, which you know, forced capitalists to reinvest their profits uh, in production and actually expand production. You know, they d were developing the productive forces. And they actually described capitalism as, um, as you know, creating wonders far surpassing the Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts and Gothic cathedrals. And uh, already by the period of, sort of 1850 to 1870, you could see that capitalism had kind of fulfilled its basic historical role, uh, or at least in, uh, in Western Europe. 
You know, you had the smashing of the old feudal orders. You had the abolition of particularism with the creation of uh, unified nation states. You had the massive development of the productive forces as well, which really provided the material basis for socialism. You know, without large-scale industry, and without a world market, we could not have the, the, the opportunity to actually uh, have a class in society. But even by that stage, you could see uh, you know, capitalism had become a fetter on the development of the productive forces. And it's, it's I think that is really why Marx and Engels made the mistake uh, of thinking that the socialist revolution was imminent. But, you know, with the development of world trade, you know, giving capitalism new resources, new markets for its goods, capitalism was still able to expand, was still able to be to develop. And thus it proved itself to be what we call a relative fetter on production, not an absolute one. Meaning, you know, relative in the sense that a planned socialist economy, you would have seen far higher rates of development, a far, far more sort of even and, and harmonious uh, development of the productive forces. Thus, from the period of around 1870 to 1914, you actually had a generalized upswing of capitalism. Uh, you had production of uh, important commodities increasing in all the advanced capitalist countries. And uh, <coughs> you also had the realization of Marx's foresight that our free competition arises giant monopolies. Uh, you have the centralization of capital into a few gigantic international companies. You also had the development of uh, globalization which uh, is nothing new at all. You know, you see in these kind of uh, textbooks and academic things, they talk about it being a recent phenomenon. But it's actually, uh, it goes back all the way to, to this period. And it's really about the drive for, for more resources, uh, more spheres of influence, but ultimately, like, more markets. Meaning, uh, you know, the capitalists had to expand their operations all over the world. And uh, due to competition, you know, if they didn't, if they stood still, then their competitors would beat them to it and they would drive them out of business. There's a certain logic to this development. But by 1914, though, you saw a definitive uh, change in the role of capitalism. You know, the world was dominated by a few monopolies in each industry, and it was completely divided up by a handful of imperialist powers. And it's really the conditions that Lenin uh, describes in his book, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. And it was such that the, the world could only really be redivided through uh, a massive imperialist war. And that really shows it's clear proof that capitalism was no longer a progressive system. You know, it was no longer able to actually develop the, the productive forces. And this, this, the war very clearly showed that the very factors that had driven capitalism forward, uh, you know, private ownership of the means of production and the nation state on the other, uh, were now massive barriers to the further development of society. And, uh, and thus the war ushered in a period of capitalist decay afterwards. You know, it had this period of what we call like wars, revolutions and counter-revolutions. And you can see a whole uh, period of the 20th century was uh, dominated by this. And uh, really the, it was the failure of the working class in the advanced capitalist countries at the end of First World War to take power, which we've always got to stress was due to the leadership of the, the working class movements in those countries. Uh, it wasn't due to, to workers you know, not being prepared or you know, not wanting to change society. Um, but it was this, uh, this political failure which really allowed capitalism to, to recover and keep ploughing on. You know, there's no final crisis of capitalism. And, uh, <clears throat> but you know, unlike before, production would, would increase but also go back down again massively. You know, it was a period of, kind of uh, you know, sharp ups and downs but a general period of, uh, of decline. So growth was also extremely uneven across the world. So you, had, you did have high gr uh, rates of growth in some areas. You know, they talk of the roaring 20s in the USA in the 20s. Uh, but you know, there was weak growth or even decline or stagnation in, in others, in places like Britain and Germany. But you know, as is inevitable under capitalism, you saw a massive crisis uh, develop in 1929, uh, the like of which you've never really seen before in the whole of history. And all the main capitalist countries with really, I guess, the exception of uh, Japan, uh, <coughs> you know, faced a massive uh, collapse. And there was a, you know, a huge collapse in the utilisation of uh, the productive potential. And it was in this period you saw massive unemployment. So uh, in the century before 1914, unemployment in Britain averaged, you know, oscillated, but averaged around 3 to 4%. Now between 1919 uh, 19 to th 1939, it averaged 13%. But actually, in areas of the world, you saw unemployment rates of about 25% uh, or thereabouts. And this leads, obviously, to an increasing questioning of the system. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, workers can see idle factories existing side by side with mass unemployment. 
And uh, you know, confidence in this, it, the system is increasingly lost. Uh, you know, it's, it's seen as a system that's unable to take society forward, unable to provide the goods. And it was in this context that uh, John Maynard Keynes first wrote, uh, well, firstly, The Means to Prosperity in 1933, uh, and later in 1936, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And one of his key concerns was how to get rid of this mass unemployment that came about during uh, the crisis. Now Keynes actually thought that the problem was one of demand, or, or more accurately what he termed effective demand. So as in demand from, uh, from both consumption of workers and capitalists, but also demand from, of investment as well from capitalists. And it's uh, what was alluded to earlier in the day of really, he saw the problem as one of being under consumption. You know, people weren't consuming enough. If only we could just increase the demand, then everything would be okay. <coughs> and he thought that well, in a crisis, you ended up with this uh, vicious cycle of you know, unemployment, therefore low consumption from workers, uh, you couldn't afford to buy goods on the market. Therefore, low investment from capitalists, because you know, why invest in producing things when nobody can afford to buy them? Uh, and then you know, the market for their goods fell away. And you know, since there was limited effective demand from workers and capitalists, he argued that the state must step in in order to plug that gap uh, and therefore break out of this vicious cycle. He thought that you know, the, only, the only way to do this would be for the state to intervene. And therefore, he thought that public spending on things like infrastructure or housing, but he even put forward the argument that even completely uh, useless things, so uh, you know, things like you could pay workers to, to dig holes and then pay other workers to you know, um, fill them back in again. And, you know, that's a kind of uh, uh, simplification of, of, of what he said, but it's essentially that kind of argument of all that's necessary is just to get money into people's pockets. It doesn't matter what they're doing. And uh, in that way, unemployment would be reduced and then the whole system would kind of regather its momentum. But it's interesting to note that Keynes, he wasn't writing on the side of the unemployed or even the working class generally, uh, but very much from the side of the bourgeoisie. And he was actually very open about that. He actually said, the class struggle will see me on the side of the educated bourgeoisie. And he was openly opposed to socialism, to Bolshevism, to the Russian Revolution. Uh, and he was actually a lifelong member of the Liberal Party and was one of their key advisors. This was the classic party of British capitalism in uh, the, the 19th and early 20th century. What he effectively wanted to do was to try and turn back the wheel of history to this kind of, uh, you know, away from this period of monopolies and uh, the world dominated by finance capital and, uh, and such, to a kind of imaginary period that he thought where you would have uh, a period of, well, kind of responsible capitalism where he thought you would have like kind of local business owners investing in their factories, investing in their communities, uh, you know, for the benefit of their communities as a whole. Uh, and you could, I think you can clearly see he saw the destructive uh, features of capitalism. And uh, I, I think his consciousness was shaped by that turbulent period that he, uh, he lived through, you know, from the First World War onwards. And, you know, who knows what, he, what actually went through his mind. But uh, I would... I would posit that he was probably afraid of the revolutionary uh, developments that you could see being likely to occur unless some sort of solution could be found to uh, the crisis. I think really, in a word, he wanted to save the system from itself. And uh, it's therefore, I think, ironic to see his views being echoed today in the labour movement, but from the opposite side of the class struggle. But it's not at all surprising when you think of it, because really his theory is a way of trying to, to square the circle, if you will, you know, trying to have a nice, responsible capitalism. Uh, you know, trying to essentially solve the problems of the working class, but without a struggle, without a revolution. But one of the main problems with Keynes is that he didn't actually explain why capitalism goes into a crisis in the first place. You know, he only really tried to offer some kind of solution to getting out of the crisis. I'd say he had a very idealistic explanation for why capitalists don't invest. Uh, you know, he suggested that it was due to just animal spirits of the capitalists. Uh, you know, in effect, business confidence. But it doesn't explain, you know, why confidence in the economy dries up in the first place. Is it, you know, does, is it just that suddenly capitalists just wake up, they, they get out of bed one day and think, mm, I'm, not, I'm not very confident about the, uh, the economy now, maybe I just shouldn't invest. No, clearly there are material reasons for that confidence drying up in the first place. And Marx actually explained this on a materialist basis uh, about 60 years prior to Keynes. 
and argued that it was uh, capitalism enters into crisis due to the fact that its production is, is privately owned and it's therefore an inevitable uh, feature of a system that produces only for profit. And this is since, as, you know, as Marx explained and as we've, uh, we've discussed earlier, you know, profit doesn't just fall from the sky. You know, it, it, money doesn't just simply breed money, as the mercantilists thought, or as you know, the bankers think today. But you know, it comes from the surplus labor of the working class. And therefore, part of the value that workers produce from their labor is obviously paid back to them in wages. But this tends to be restricted to the minimum necessary to keep them alive and reproduce them as a class uh, at a certain standard of living. And obviously that standard of living can be increased through class struggle. You know, the, the standard that's considered the minimum today in Britain is different to, to, to what it was considered you know, 100 years ago or different to what it's considered to in China today. Uh, but, but that's, you know, the wages are only part of the value that's produced. The rest of that value obviously is what marks time surplus uh, labour, surplus value. And that's appropriated by the capitalists in the form of profit, interest and rent. So the working class obviously only receives a fraction of the value it produces. The problem then for the capitalists is that because their system is based on commodity production, uh, it's, it's produced as well you know, on commodity exchange. They actually have to sell their commodities in order to realize this profit. But if workers are only paid a fraction of the total value that they produce, where is the demand going to come in order to, to buy back all these commodities? You could then really pose the question, not why does capitalism enter into crisis, but why isn't capitalism permanently in crisis? You, know, you would think from, from that, uh, that, that way of uh, seeing it, that it should always uh, have this like, permanent contradiction. But you know, Marx ex uh, pointed to various ways that the capitalists overcome this. You know, firstly, you know, if the working class in one country can't afford to, to buy back what they produce, then uh, the capitalists export their goods and sell them in, in other markets around the world. And this is what you really saw with uh, the British Empire in the 19th century. It's what you see today with China. The problem is it doesn't actually solve the problem at all. It just merely shifts it around the world. Uh, you know, not all countries can be net exporters. Some have to be net importers as well. Secondly, not all demand comes from the working class buying consumer goods. You know, we touched on this in the first session. That you know, if the capitalists, if they're not to be swallowed up by their competition, they're forced to reinvest a part of their profits into production, you know, uh, building more machines, more factories, more means of production. And it's what uh, Marx referred to as department one goods, uh, you know, means of production, as opposed to department two goods, means of consumption. And there can be a certain balance between the two. The point though, though that Adam made earlier is though that this doesn't solve the contradiction. You know, since in order to, to, to profitably use department one goods, you know, if you, if you develop more means of production, you actually have to use them to produce more commodities or even more means of production. And therefore it just sets up the problem on a higher and higher level. Thirdly, there's the use of credit. So you, you, know, you can give workers the ability to buy more today, uh, but that comes with a, another problem is that you expand the market artificially today but at the expense of tomorrow. You, know, you have to pay back that credit with interest. Uh, <coughs> there's also the problem that you know, due to competition, due to the, sort of the logic of the market, capitalists are forced to produce commodities as cheaply as possible to try and undercut their uh, competition. And therefore, they'll try and do everything they can to make these uh, commodities as cheap, cheap as possible, including cutting their workers' wages um, or replacing their workers with machines. Now, there's this, this dialectical, co dialectical contradiction there in that, as what Adam explained earlier, what's rational for each capitalist on an individual basis is not rational for their class as a whole. And they're, by cutting their own workers' wages, they're actually ultimately cutting away the very demand in the economy that they need in order to, to buy their goods in the first place. You know, it's like they're, they're sitting on a branch and sawing it away. They're, cu they're cutting the ground from uh, beneath them. And it creates this vicious cycle that Keynes actually uh, alluded to. But the, the key point is not a crisis of uh, underconsumption, but it's a crisis of overproduction. You know, there's a, a key distinction. Uh, it's that too many goods are produced, you know, not for the needs of uh, the market, uh, but it's, it's too many goods that can be absorbed by the narrow uh, ability of the market to actually absorb them. And, uh, and that, becomes, that comes because of this system of uh, you know, private ownership. Now, um, <clears throat> Keynesian policies were actually implemented in the, the USA uh, you know, with the New Deal, and also uh, in Britain as well, in the Great Depression. <coughs> 
But the key point that we need to raise is that it wasn't actually Keynesian uh, policies that ended the, the Great Depression. It, this only really came about when you started having the preparations for World War II and a shift to the war economy. You had a program of rearmament, you know, which forced industry to, to reinvest. You also had conscription, which uh, you know, massively mopped up the, uh, the huge unemployment that existed. Um, <clears throat> but also after the war, you did see governments all over the world actually enacting Keynesian policies, and uh, you had uh, you know massive state spending, uh, you know what's referred to as deficit financing, and you see both Labour governments, Tory governments, and Britain enacting the same policies as what came to be known as the post-war consensus, and so this con coincided with the biggest boom in uh, in capitalism's history. I said before, nearly over a quarter of a century of, of nearly uninterrupted growth. And it's what's thought for, for as of uh, the golden age of capitalism. And you, as I said uh, before, you saw rising living standards, full employment, and therefore illusions in reformism greatly strengthened. But we should always point out that you know, it's, uh, the reforms weren't just simply handed down by the capitalist class as a gift. Uh, but they were always on, you know, one on the back of uh, working class struggle. So, uh, you know, particularly if you look in Britain, for example, the, uh, the development of the welfare state was you know, put in place by the 1945 Labour government after the war. But it was, uh, it was ultimately the capitalists were prepared to accept these huge concessions from above in order to try and stave off a revolution from below. And actually this period, just immediately after World War II, I mean, similarly to the end of World War I, you actually saw kind of like a revolutionary wave sweep many areas of the world. And there were significant struggles in one country after another. For example, uh, in Greece, in Italy, in France, in uh, most of Eastern Europe, in China, for example. But actually, it was the actions of both the Stalinists and the Social Democrats in these countries which led to the defeat of each of these movements and uh, all their channeling into reformist currents, such as in Britain and the Labour government. And it was in this respect that Ted Grant actually uh, pointed out that it was the political failure of the Stalinists and the Social Democrats to actually take power you know, in Britain and Western Europe that created the political climate for a recovery of capitalism. Uh, you know, we often re refer to as, you know, uh, it's often the leaders of the working class movement which act, act as like one of the main props of capitalism and that without those, uh, those leaders, capitalism you know, wouldn't be able to last uh, you know, a, a few weeks. But you very much see this in this period. And I'd actually recommend watching Ken Loach's documentary, if you haven't seen it, the one called uh, The Spirit of 45, uh, to see what I really mean by this. Because although it's not the message of the film, I think the actual message is, uh, is, is quite a reformist one, and it's actually uh, very much the kind of uh, thing that I alluded to at the start, where it's just saying, oh, we, just, we need a return to Keynesianism and everything would be great. But that actually, uh, there's, a, there's a huge number of interviews and, and things with workers who lived through that period, recalling uh, you know, what it was actually like then. And uh, what really comes across is um, you know, the, the revolutionary potential that existed then, and uh, you know, how the working class, after the horrors of the war, were not prepared to go back to the conditions of the 30s, but were actually desperate for some kind of fundamental change, desperate for socialism. And that actually, if, it, if the movement had been led by real revolutionaries uh, in the Labour Party, they could have definitely seized that moment and gone all the way. Well, anyway, the situation generally, I'd say, puzzled the leaders of the Fourth International, who were basing themselves on Trotsky's perspectives before the war, which was really that the war would end with a massive crisis of capitalism and socialist revolution. And, and some of these leaders of the Fourth International even uh, went as far to say that because there was no revolution, uh, the war hadn't actually ended, which is, you know, just shows a complete abandonment of the Marxist method and just being replaced by a very mechanical fetishization of just ready-made formula and, uh, and, and ready-made perspectives. When this perspective was falsified by events, as it clearly was, many of its leaders ended up doing a complete 180 degree turn and ended up uh, really adapting themselves to Keynesianism and uh, to reformist ideas. So you, see, you saw some, for example, Tony Cliff, who many of you might be familiar, he was the, sort of the, the leader and main theoretician of uh, what became the Socialist Workers' Party in Britain. He thought that capitalism has solved its uh, contradictions through this uh, idea of the permanent arms economy. Uh, and he tried to explain the post-war boom in terms of the high level of military spending uh, on arms, particularly by the USA and Britain, on things like the, the Korean War, just the Cold War generally, also the Vietnam War. Uh, 
and uh, and he thought that you know military expenditure had eliminated uh, like boom and bust, and therefore uh, the working class would revolt against capitalism not because of some kind of economic crisis or you know deep crisis, but simply just due to alienation and the the, the impacts of that. You had others such as Ernst Man Mandel, one of the other former leaders of the Fourth International. He actually completely abandoned the working class entirely in the advanced capitalist countries and actually said that the French workers had become bourgeoisified. And this was, uh, he was even saying this, you know, he said they wouldn't move, nothing was going to happen in France. He even was saying this in the beginning of 1968, the very year that the French workers did move, and what, which was at that point in history the biggest general strike in the world, with 10 million workers uh, coming out on strike. And it was actually only Ted Grant uh, who actually who was really the, one of the only leaders of the Fourth International, who, you know, immediately after the war, uh, against this perspective of you know, imminent collapse and revolution, he actually had a, you know, a very sober assessment and actually explained the real causes for the recovery and for the boom. But then after all the leaders had gone over to reformism and, uh, you know, thought capitalism had solved its problems, he was, he was one of the only ones really who actually explained that, no, uh, another world slump was an inevitability. Uh, due to the very contradictions of the boom itself. And he actually published an article in 1960 called Will There Be a Slump? He didn't just give one reason for the boom, but explained there was a dialectical interaction between many different factors. So I'll, actually, I'll run through the ones that he, uh, he gives. As I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a significant political factor of uh, the betrayal of the, the Stalinists and the Social Democrats, uh, you know, preparing the political ground for a recovery. Um, importantly, there was the destructive effects of the war, you know, in destroying massive means of production, you know, stocks of consumer goods, uh, you know, whole neighbourhoods, whole industrial areas. Um, you know, it's very similar to the effects of a crisis. You know, if you look at like, uh, Europe, huge amounts of the, the cities and the continent have been completely destroyed. Uh, you know, you only have to just explore this area to see that you know, most of, uh, of the houses or the buildings uh, come from that period of uh, the late 40s, 50s and 60s because everything else was completely bombed out and destroyed and if you look at, uh, you can see some aerial footage of cities in Europe after the war and it looks like the kind of images you see from Aleppo and, and Syria today just complete, just whole uh, areas of, of cities completely bombed out and destroyed and so obviously that, that has the effect similarly to a crisis of destroying excess capacity and it means that there's uh, a need to then rebuild and reinvest in actually uh, developing uh, production uh, back again. And actually, according to the UN, Ted points this out, the effects of this reconstruction uh, on the boom actually only ended in 1958, or thereabouts, I think. There's also the Marshall Plan, which in today's uh, money would, would be equivalent to about $130 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, which was given or just simply uh, or loaned or given uh, to countries, uh, particularly in Western Europe, in order to try and create a buffer against the USSR, uh, but also cut across uh, any kind of revolutionary developments by, um, by relaxing the need for austerity measures. These loans or grants were uh, typically used to then buy back American goods. Uh, so, you know, it was this kind of uh, you know, virtuous cycle, particularly for the USA. Um, there was also enormously increased investment in industry, particularly with the growth of new industries that arose uh, during the war, things like plastics, aluminium, uh, rocket technology, electronics and atomic energy. There's also the massively increasing output of newer industries, so things like the chemicals industry, artificial fibres, synthetic rubber, uh, plastics, light metals, you know, electric household goods, you know, you know, washing machines, things like that, fridges natural gas, electric energy, and all sorts of building activity. And it really benefited from this general development of science and technology uh, during the war and afterwards as well. Uh, plus also new methods of industrial management, supply chain management, leading to a generalized uh, increase in productivity. There's also a huge amount of fictitious capital created by military spending, uh, which averaged about 10% of GDP in both Britain and the USA, it's an astro astronomical amount of uh, spending. There was also the role of the colonial revolutions around the world in this period, and uh, the independence of, uh, of undeveloped countries, giving rise to this uh, new local bourgeoisie, uh, which had an increased opportunity to actually develop their own industry in these countries. 
Uh, but also, on the other side of that, you had, uh, due to the boom in the advanced capitalist countries, an increasing demand for raw materials from the rest of the world, from the former colonial world. Uh, so you can see that the, you know, the two things are interrelated. You also had the role of state intervention, so you know, what we call Keynesian policies, and in terms of you know, creation of welfare states, softening the impact of uh, unemployment. But you also had the nationalization of unproductive industries, uh, you know, things such as the steel industry, coal industry, transport, power. Uh, and really, you can see the capitalists in many countries are extremely happy for this to occur because uh, they, in effect, use state financing to you know, take over uh, industries that were completely uh, you know, devastated by the war, needed huge investment to bring them up to modern standards. Um, but also, then, by doing so, they were able to provide the rest of industry uh, with you know, cheap materials, cheap electricity, uh, but then once these industries have been modernized, they often then privatize them again. So it's a you know, classic case of uh, you know, nationalize the losses, privatize the profits. There's also a, a huge increase in uh, world trade following the war. So you had the removal of protectionist barriers, which were often a precondition for receiving this martial aid that I talked about before. Uh, but there's also the role of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the Bretton Woods system which actually forced countries to maintain a fixed exchange uh, uh, rate with the dollar, which really prevented uh, pre uh, competitive devaluations, pre you know, uh, and instead forced internal devaluations, you know, cuts against wages, terms and conditions, things like this. Um, <clears throat> tied to this was the role of the USA, which you know, emerged from the Second World War enormously strengthened. Uh, it was probably the only continent that wasn't uh, you know, significantly uh, destroyed. And it had you know, two thirds of the world's uh, gold was actually sitting in Fort Knox in uh, 1945. So the dollar was literally as good as gold. And uh, they, they also pushed for um, you know, monetarist policies within the IMF and uh, within the, the Bretton Woods system. So all these factors uh, interacted and, and you know, fed back on each other, creating this kind of virtuous cycle of boom. But Ted pointed out that the main factor was was really the enormously uh, expanded scope for capital investment, which he points out is like the main motor force for, uh, for development under capitalism. And uh, it's important to note that you know, the reason why this was all made possible was not due to Keynesian policies either before or after the war, but it was due to the war itself. So you had, as I said, on the one hand, the massive destruction of the war, you know, eliminating the, the previous crisis of overproduction, requiring massive investment to rebuild, uh, but on the other hand, you had you know, this huge development of science, technique, you know, new technologies for the needs of the war. So, you know, despite the enormous uh, development of the productive forces in this period, it was only made possible by a system that demanded the deaths of you know, tens of millions of people, destruction of whole continents. Uh, you know, that's, what's, that's what was meant by this thing of creative destruction. If, you know, it's hardly a, a, a progressive feature. But it's important to stress that, you know, when you hear reformists uh, pointing out you had this huge deficit after the war, but we still created the NHS, I say, yes, yeah, there was a huge deficit. Uh, I think it was about sort of 240 or 50 percent of GDP in Britain. But the, the, the thing to stress is that it was an entirely different situation, entirely different um, prospect to the situation that we have today. Back then, they were, they were in a conditions of, of worldwide boom. Uh, made possible by the effects of the war. You know, today, the, rather than a worldwide boom, we have a worldwide crisis. Uh, you know, with recessions or stagnations or sharp declines in the uh, development of world trade. You know, there's no prospect of uh, the USA coming along with a uh, you know, massive program of martial aid. Uh, you know, we're not facing years ahead of growth rates of you know six to ten percent or more. So, um, you know, we have to we have to point that out because you hear this kind of thing all the time. But also in Ted's, Ted's article, he also points out how the, the capitalist boom would in inevitably end up in a slum. You know, the boom itself contained the seeds of its own destruction. And I think that's extremely relevant today because he's, he's fundamentally explaining why Keynesian policies are fundamentally flawed. Uh, it's the, the same policies are extremely popular with reformists within the labor movement. So you know, looking at this in more detail, it's the Keynesians, and Keynesians ultimately think that state intervention in the economy can solve the problems of capitalism, you know, which sounds great. But uh, the major problem with uh, this whole idea is that 
you know, in a state in an economy which is dominated by private ownership, you know, a capitalist economy, the state doesn't actually have any money of its own. You know, it has to either raise it through taxes, it has to borrow the money, or it has to simply print the money. Uh, but it doesn't actually just have its own uh, source of income. So regarding taxes, you know, these taxes have to come from somewhere. You can't uh, you know, prevent a crisis over the long term. You know, either you, you tax the capitalists, and therefore you're uh, eating into their profits, you you uh, generate a decline in the rate of profit. Or, um, and of course, if things aren't sufficiently profitable, then the capitalists won't invest their money. They're only investing for a certain rate of profit. They will just take their money elsewhere. And that really highlights the limitations of the nation state. But also, if you tax the working class, you're eating into the very demand that you're trying to stimulate. Uh, you know, sort of taking from with one hand, uh, giving back from the other. Uh, as to the so-called deficit financing, we've got, we've got to point out the state is spending money that it doesn't have. I is trying to generate money, but without creating, without putting back any kind of equivalent value uh, into the economy to back up this uh, this money supply. It's the same thing with uh, you know military spending. It's it's what we refer to as fictitious capital. You know, it's production that's for destruction, not for exchange or investment. And therefore, you know, money is being pumped into the economy on a huge scale with no actual real value to uh, to back it up. And it shows uh, really this fallacy of the idea of the permanent arms economy of uh, Cliff and others, which really, as I said before, is, is a capitulation to Keynesianism. And it doesn't solve the, uh, the, the crisis. And it actually leads to massive inflation, which is you know, really the debasement of the currency. You end up with, uh, in the long term, this, this will actually reduce demand uh, unless workers struggle to try and uh, obtain a corresponding wage increase. And because uh, otherwise you won't be able to actually afford as much as before because the price of everything is increased. And unless your wages incre increase with that, obviously you're much uh, poorer. And that is precisely what did occur in one country after the other uh, in the late 60s and, the, and in the 1970s. The rate of inflation actually went up to around 30% in many countries, uh, including in Britain. And there was a huge wave of class struggle, you know, as workers strove to just keep their wages uh, in pace with this, uh, this huge um, inflation. And it, it really shows the limits of trying to have the state regulate the economy on, on the, for the benefit of the capitalist class as a whole. You know, if you only nationalise 20% of the economy or so, as was the case in Britain, uh, it's still the other 80% that's privately owned which is going to uh, be decisive. And it's, uh, ultimately it's the market that it takes to the state. Uh, and in particularly when you consider it, when it's, the economy isn't just one national uh, thing, but it's, we're part of an international world market. Um, you can see this today with uh, the steel crisis. But you know, despite the problem of deficit financing of uh, nationalised industries, you know, ultimately the demand in these industries for things like steel and coal, electricity, that's is determined by the uh, the needs of the other eighty percent of the market. And so, the, when when the, the the private industry goes into crisis, so too will the nationalised industries. Furthermore, you know, both Keynesian investment, like public investment but also private investment in productive industries actually creates the problem that I alluded to before, which is that you know, if you create more means of production, then uh, you actually have to find a, a market for those goods. You have to have, uh, you know, it tends towards this situation of overproduction, and it just builds it up onto a higher and higher scale. This, uh, this situation as well is exacerbated by the fact that although living standards actually increased during this period, you know, real wages went up, the actual share of GDP that went to workers as opposed to the, to the capitalists and, and bankers actually declined over this period. Most of the gains went to the ruling class and obviously not to the workers. Again, this exacerbates overproduction. There's an increasing gulf between what can be, uh, what can be absorbed in the market and, uh, and what can't. And thus, the boom itself prepared the ground for, for the crisis of the 1970s. You know, it's interesting to note that as world trade increased, uh, it created this world market, but also it creates a worldwide crisis when that crisis does eventually break out. Now you saw the, the kind of the spark for the, uh, the the crisis in the 1970s, really being the the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, but that in itself was really a result of the contradictions of the previous period reaching the surface. In particular, you had you know things like huge spending on the Vietnam War by the USA. Uh, you had an enormous. Uh, you know, um, trade deficit with other countries. This put unbearable pressure on the, do the dollar, 
And therefore, in 1971, the USA had to abandon the convertibility of dollar to, uh, dollars to gold, and they floated the, the dollar, which really be began the collapse of that whole system, the uh, Bretton Woods system. And this was exacerbated by the oil crisis in the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And this uh, caused uh, the OPEC then led an oil embargo, led to uh, prices massively shooting up, led to huge deficits, uh, you know, huge defaults on payments. And it sparked this worldwide crisis that you saw in the 70s. But these things were really kind of accidents that expressed the, the inner necessity in the same way that the, you know, the, the bursting of the subprime mortgage crisis in the USA was really just the tipping point of a generalized crisis, crisis of overproduction that had been built up over decades uh, previously. And you ended up with this situation of uh, what's called stagflation. So you know, low growth, high unemployment, but also alongside high inflation which according to Keynes isn't supposed to be possible. Uh, according to Keynes, you know, high inflation was supposed to reflect high demand for goods and also therefore a high demand for labour. So you shouldn't have unemployment um, going along with this. Therefore, it was in this period in the 1970s uh, that the ruling class really abandoned Keynesianism, uh, you know, the, the abandoned policies of debt financing, abandoned printing money to just you know, pay for these kind of things. As, Quite simply, it just didn't work. It led to this situation of massive uh, crisis, led to huge inflation and, uh, and, and huge class struggle. And that's why you saw this, uh, this shift away to monetarist policy um, and what is also termed, to, termed by many as neoliberalism, which I would argue isn't just some kind of like just evil ideology that just dropped from the sky. It's not just some kind of nasty policy. It's really just the, the policies that was necessary by the capitalist class for them to restore profitability. Uh, so, you know, it includes things like massive attacks on the working class, massive attacks on trade unions, you know, privatizing you know, public industries, reducing state expenditure, including welfare payments, all these kind of things, and therefore reducing taxes, therefore, you know, re uh, increasing the rate of profit. Therefore, it's interesting that, uh, you know, for, for these neoliberals, you know, they say that the state should play no role, but actually to to achieve these kind of things, these kind of policies, actually requires a very strong state in the form of like the police, the army, prisons, and so forth, because uh, it requires like huge uh, battles with the working class. But anyway, just to sum up, really, the main points I want to emphasise is really just that you know the conditions for the post-war boom were pretty unique. They rose out of the devastation of the war itself and uh, the technical advances that went with it. We're not likely to see a repeat of these conditions. Uh, you know, the Third World War was pretty much ruled out due to you know, nuclear weapons, due to the class balance of forces. Uh, that also, you know, despite the huge illusions of, uh, of Keynesianism, no amount of deficit financing could actually avert a crisis of uh, capitalism. And in fact, it actually made the crisis of the 1970s much more severe uh, than it had been otherwise. Uh, but you know, despite this, these illusions are very, still very strong today. And many think that the answer to, the, to our current situation is a return to Keynesianism. I said that's really the essence of uh, Corbynomics, maybe a point that someone wants to develop more in the discussion. Uh, but you can, you, know, you can actually see before our very eyes the results of the biggest uh, Keynesian program in history, which is that of China since, nine, uh, since 2009. But despite enormous investment in you know, infrastructure, housing, more means of production, they're now facing this monumental crisis of overproduction, uh, which is, uh, you know, about to burst uh, before our eyes. It just really shows that it's impossible to just tinker around with the edges of capitalism. Uh, you can't just create some kind of responsible capitalism that works well for everybody. But what is necessary is to understand the laws of uh, the economy, so that you know we're not subjected to them as blind forces. But you know, in order for that to actually be possible, we actually have to have real control over the economy. Uh, we have to be able to plan it, uh, you know, rather than us being controlled by the, the invisible hand of the market. But so, you know, once we actually have that control, we will be able to do things like eliminate poverty, eliminate hunger, eliminate homelessness, you know, all these kind of things. We'll actually be able to provide a world of plenty for everybody, and that's our task ahead. Sorry.